this tricky pass is for the more experienced off-road driver. It's a wonderful shortcut along the main wild coast route, cutting out a long section of fairly boring villages, and it will save you about an hour on your ETA. The deep valley carved out by the Umnenu River stretches far inland, where the main road loops around to avoid the deep valley. The pass has wonderful scenery, but most of it is obscured by dense bush and lantana, which grows about 4 meters high. From the northern start, the road passes through a small village, then there's a fork where you must keep right. This is followed by a second fork 100 meters further, where you must again keep right. The descent gradient here is fairly gentle at 1 in 12. This pass is not suitable for inexperienced drivers, and if you venture down it in a non-four-wheel drive vehicle, the chances are high that you will get yourself into trouble. The road is seldom used and has become quite badly overgrown. In places lower down the valley, closer to the river, the bushes encroached on both sides of the road to the point that it's nothing more than a footpath. All vehicles will get scratched. The bridge at the river crossing has been washed away, but the crossing is not difficult or dangerous unless the river is flowing strongly. Mostly, it's nothing more than about 30 centimeters deep. Most of the road has deep ruts and in some places the dongas are quite serious. If it's raining, it would be advisable not to drive this pass even in a 4x4. At the 700 meters mark, the road levels off briefly and a quarry can be seen on the right. The gradient steepens sharply after the quarry and settles in at 1 in 7 as the road plunges into vast stands of lantana. As pretty as the flowers are, this is an invasive species and has taken over large tracts of the wild coast. It's a type of bramble and has thorns which are bad news for humans, animals and vehicles. The Umnano River has an interesting feature in that it has a name change a few kilometers inland where it's known as the Sazinga River. Despite the growing influence of Western culture, many Koza people still practice their traditions and cultural customs. The Koza were originally cattle herders who are traditionally very hard-working and resilient people. Many families have ancestral homesteads in areas like the Eastern Cape of South Africa, but work in more developed towns and cities like Cape Town and Johannesburg. The Koza people have a range of cultural customs that they adhere by. Some traditional practices include the initiation of males when they are of age, which involves them going to initiation school, receiving sacred teachings from their elders and emerging as men. Another practice is lobola, which is the payment made by a man who seeks to marry a woman. He must offer the woman's father and family payment in the form of livestock or other items for her hand in marriage. At the 1.5 kilometer mark, the gradient eases right off, as the track at this point is badly overgrown, often enveloping three quarters of the road width. During the rainy season, which is in summer, this section usually has water and mud to trap the unwary. The river crossing itself is reached at the 1.7 kilometer mark, where you will see the broken remains of the original concrete bridge. Keep to the left of the bridge and cross the river after checking it for depth. There are usually cattle around at this point. Continue over the short rocky section and follow your nose as the road plunges back into the bush where it swings sharply to the right and rejoins the original road some 40 meters further. Next up is the climb out of the valley, which is by far the longer portion of the pass, lasting 3,3 kilometers. Due to the dense vegetation, the beautiful views are mostly obscured and it's probable that this road has seen zero maintenance in the last two decades. The heading is generally into the west for the entire ascent, so if you're driving this in the afternoon, you'll have the sun right in your eyes. The climb out has some steep sections, but they are generally only over short distances. For most of the climb, the gradients are around 1 in 9. Getting back to the Koza culture, Deaths and funeral proceedings are also done in a very traditional manner. More modernized Koza people tend to be less strict on certain customs, while the elders are usually adamant on keeping traditions and customs going on in the family. Historically, homesteads called Imizi of the Koza culture tended to be scattered over the rural landscape and were situated on ridges to facilitate drainage and military defense. Dwellings consisted of a circular frame of poles and saplings, which were bent and bound in the shape of a beehive and thatched from top to bottom with grass. 
To ensure adequate insulation, the inside of the thatch was plastered with a mixture of mud and dung from ground level to about shoulder height. The floor of the dwelling was also plastered with a mixture of mud and dung. A low-rimmed circular depression in the center of the floor served as a hearth. This type of dwelling, known as Unkopanzi, had a low doorway and a person had to stoop to enter it. During the early 1820s, this structure was superseded by a more durable and permanent style, which consisted of a circular wattle and daub wall, incorporating methods of construction that had been introduced by missionaries, such as Dr. J.T. von der Kemp, supporting a thatched conical roof. The dwellings comprising the homestead were usually grouped in a semicircle facing onto a large circular brushwood cattle wire, which would have had one of the smaller byres situated on its sides for keeping goats. One or more bottle-shaped pits for storing maize were normally located under the floor of the cattle byre. These grain pits were well plastered and sealed with large stones in order to prevent water seepage and the consequent spoilage of maize through fermentation and rotting. At the best of times, the maize was stored in these pits and had a musty odor and a sour taste. But it was tolerated and even enjoyed, particularly during the seasons when maize was in short supply. Also situated outside, behind or adjacent to the houses, were screened off cooking areas, an earthen oven for baking maize bread known as a sonka, as well as one or more wickerwork bins made of saplings for storing maize on the cob. The swept area between the doorway of the main house and the gateway of the cattle buyer was known as the courtyard in Kunda. This was where court cases were heard at the great place of a chief or paramount chief. Homesteads were economically self-sufficient entities with holdings of livestock and lands for cultivation and hunting. A typical homestead had a number of houses in which a man, his married sons, their wives and their offspring resided. When traveling along the wild coast it helps a lot to learn a few phrases of Koza. Near the end of the pass, a few huts and houses make an appearance which are on the outskirts of the village of Mdlakatweni.